calling the board meeting to order in a moment. Could we please hold comments while SPS TV takes us live? After a five minute pause, I will call us to order. This is Director Hampson. I am now calling the February 10th, 2021 regular board meeting to order at 3.31 p.m. This meeting is being recorded. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands and traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people. Ms. Wilson-Jones, the roll call, please. Director DeWolf. Present. Director Harris. She may be with us a few minutes late. Okay, uh, Director Hersey. Director Hersey. Oh, sorry, and he, he also may be a few minutes late. Director Rankin. I'm here. Director Rivera-Smith. Present. And Director Hampson. Here. Superintendent Juneau is also joining us for today's meeting and additional staff will be briefing the board as we move through the agenda. As we begin this meeting, I would also like to welcome Kira Bloomhagen, who is joining us as the student representative from Ingram High School and Seattle Skills Center today. We'll be hearing from Kira later in the meeting. This meeting is being held remotely per the governor's proclamation prohibiting meetings such as this one from being held in person. The public is being provided remote access today by phone and through SPS TV by broadcast and streaming on YouTube. To facilitate this meeting, I will ask all participants to ensure you are muted when you are not speaking. Staff may be muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear directors and staff. I will now turn it over to Superintendent Juneau for her comments. Thank you, President Hampson, and good afternoon, directors. Um, I'll just share a quick update on our in-person reopening planning um, so far. Uh, Dr. Clover Cod, Dr. Pedroza, and Chief Berge continue to negotiate the working conditions with our labor partners, the Seattle Education Association. Um, at this time, the current MOU that was negotiated back in August 2020 is still in effect and will remain in that way until, uh, of course, until there's a new MOU. I just wanna thank everyone um, who is at the table working toward an agreement. It's really hard work and I appreciate all of those efforts. Chief Jesse and the health service team continue work to keep the safety protocols for staff and students up to date with the most recent information from the Department of Health. Currently, we have childcare in 50 of our schools, and as you know, that has been ongoing for a while, and students receiving individual instruction per their individual education plans are um, in school in 46 of our schools. Um, there have been 102 confirmed COVID-19 cases of SPS staff, students, and volunteers, but we have not seen any widespread transmission of COVID-19 in our schools. Um, these isolated cases of infection merely reflect what we would expect given the high level of, commun of community transmission. And this low rate really is because of the amazing work of our health team and the strong protocols that they've been able to put in place. Dr. Scarlett and her curriculum assessment and instruction staff continue to work with school leaders to ensure our students receive the high quality education called for in Seattle Excellence. This team is creating schedules for students and staff once we return to in-person instruction for pre-K through first grade. And so just wanna thank that team as well for their focus on the work in the strategic plan. Dr. Pedroza and the special education staff continue to support students and staff, and they are super committed to serving students in the intensive pathway models in person very soon. Um, Dr. Pedroza and the athletic staff are also working to lift high school sports later this month. We know that physical activity and social time is so important to the mental well being of our students. And we're hopeful also to have some middle school sports start in March. And I've also heard whispers that um, unified sports are also visiting about uh, maybe coming back. 
all athletics will follow the safety protocols to mitigate and manage the spread of the virus. Chief Bush is keeping child care providers are, you know, they are all the heroes that immediately jumped into action to support essential workers and other families last spring and other community partners up to date about our return to in-person instruction. Chief Podesta, the capital planning and facilities teams are in schools right now, ensuring that necessary signage is in place, that desks are set up appropriately, that air is circulating properly, and that our buildings are ready to welcome staff and students back into classrooms. Um, you can keep up to date on all of this work thanks to Chief Campbell and her communication team. Our website has the latest updates on our planning. And if you have not, not yet done so, please check it out. There is a lot of information there. I'm just really thankful for the work of teams across the district. I'm excited for more students to receive in-person instruction from our educators. I know that for most students, in-person in instruction is the most powerful method for them to learn and for staff to teach. And just a couple other things that I want to share today. Um, during winter months, we know that utility outages occur and we recently suffered one of those when all the electricity went down um, in different pockets in the city. And that really does interfere with remote learning. Occasionally, we may have unexpected technology outages and network interruptions as well. So we have prepared an outage plan to inform school communities how electricity, network, and um, learning platform interruptions will be managed. The criteria for shifting the instructional model to asynchronous or offline learning um, can be found um, online. Asynchronous learning will count as a school day. Um, Central Office has provided independent learning activities to support students during an emergency response. So I encourage everyone to access these resources and independent activities when power resumes or to print in advance um, for an emergency event. Students are always encouraged to read and to complete uncompleted school assignments and individual schools may also provide guidance on activities or resources for families to use. And so all that information can also be found on our website. Um, we've hired an ethnic studies program manager who will start next week. Um, we'll send a photo and a few uh, biography lines in this in this week's in next week's Friday memo. Um, the ethnic studies curriculum specialist positions are posted and the black studies program manager position is also posted and that, that will close early next week. So um, you can get that out to your networks. The black studies course that we have started last week. We have 52 students enrolled. The teacher is Mr. Alexander Ray, who has also been hired as the Black Studies Curriculum Specialist. We're also excited to be in partnership with local scholars and educators through the Af Africana Institute, Delbert Richardson's um, Unspoken Truths, Dr. Latasha Levy, uh, Professor of Africana Studies at UW, um, Jesse Hagopian, author, activist, and longtime SPS educators, and Nona, Noni Irvin, community leader. Um, and so there's just a lot going on, as you all know. Um, and so just with that, I'll end President Hampson and thank you, directors. Thank you. Again, I would, uh, would like to welcome Seattle Skills Center student Kira Bloomhagen. Kira is a senior at Ingram High School and Seattle Skills Center. She's passionate about inclusion and diversity in the trades. I will turn it over to you now, Kira, for your comments. Thank you, Director Hampson, for that introduction. Uh, I've always loved working with my hands, whether it's sewing my own clothing or laying up carbon fiber for a supersonic rocket. Unfortunately, very few of the classes that SPS offers are hands-on. The exception is Skill Center, which gives the students the opportunity to develop valuable job skills and take a break from the traditional classroom. The Skill Center runs classes in everything from firefighting to carpentry. While I would love to live in a world where college is accessible to every student, we don't. And even if we did, there are many students whose potential doesn't shine in the classroom. The Skill Center gives these students an opportunity to explore career options, explore other career options that are integral to our society. Without people working in the trades, it's impossible to get a car fixed or a house built. Unfortunately, these trades struggle to find an incoming workforce, workforce due largely to school's focus on sending, schools to, or on, on sending students to college. I didn't have anyone in school mention that we could pursue electrical work or carpentry as a career until I came to the Skills Center. 
Contrary to popular belief, work in the trades is a living wage is living wage work that can pay well more than jobs requiring a college degree and even jobs in engineering or other white collar fields. In addition, the training and education period is all paid as an apprenticeship or another entry level position, as opposed to sending students into debt with college. While the Skill Center isn't paying students monetarily, it is providing an essential service, both in training the students and to the community. In the construction class, when we can be in the classroom, we build tiny houses for the Low Income Housing Institute to house homeless folks. The Seattle Times declared Lehigh's tiny house villages to be the most effective immediate solution to the homelessness crisis. The Skill Center service to students and the community is provided free of charge, meaning that it can make the most difference to the most disadvantaged students. One of the things that makes the Skill Center so accessible is that the administration is set up to help every student succeed, including free uh, and timely transportation to and from their home school. I know this board is focused on equity and supporting the Skill Center and alternative education programs like it is an important way to help ensure that all students can be successful in career and life. For those watching at home, the application for next year is open now, and I would strongly encourage every student to con consider the opportunity it provides, whether or not you intend to pursue college in the future. Thank you for the time to speak today. Thank you so much, Ms. Bloom, Ms. Bloom Hagen. We've now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, second. second. I'll second it. Okay. This motion has been moved by Director Vera Smith and seconded by Director Rankin. Do any directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The consent agenda has passed unanimously. We have now reached the public testimony portion of the agenda. And I'm just, because we only have two minutes prior to the uh, public testimony portion, I'm gonna uh, slowly move us into that. Unless any committee chairs have a very short briefing they'd like to give. Director Hampson, is this a good time for committee reports? Is that? Sure, if you'd like to make a brief committee report, sure. we can take, very, we have time for one. Yep, very, very brief. So uh, last week, let me just make sure my notes correct here. Um, last week, we had our February operations committee meeting. Uh, thank you to Directors Rare Smith and Director Rankin, who are also part of the committee. Uh, it was a fairly packed agenda and we will be moving forward um, about seven board action reports that directors will see on their February 24th regular board meeting agenda. And I'll just share some of those high level updates about what bars we will be seeing um, after midwinter break at our next regular board meeting. Uh, one bar, uh, which we'll actually talk about today, is uh, focused on West Seattle Roof. Uh, we need to do some uh, a fix there. Uh, we're also presenting a bar to rename the Southwest Athletic Complex to Nino Canto South. West Athletic Complex. Uh, also very exciting, I know folks will remember last year, the directors uh, unanimously approved the resolution affirming our commitment to our LGBTQI plus student staff and community. One of the, one of the uh, pieces of that, that legislation uh, was uh, a directive to name a school in honor of an LGBTQ figure national or local. And we have a, a family support worker reach out to us uh, from Northgate Elementary to to begin the process independently. And so Northgate Elementary is in the process of renaming their elementary school to James Baldwin Academy, which is a huge deal. Uh, he's a, a famous black queer literary and cultural hero. And we also uh, will be talking about uh, the Cleveland Forest, which we've had as part of our uh, ownership at Seattle Public Schools um, 
from the Cleveland High School Alumni Association back from World War II. There's a forest that we have, and King County Conservation is working with us to hold that land uh, for conservation purposes for perpetuity. And we'll see those all at our next meeting, and that's all I have. Thanks, Director Hanson. Okay, thank you for that report on the Operations Committee, uh, Director DeWolf, our chairperson. We will next go to public testimony. We will be taking public testimony today by teleconference as stated on the agenda. For any speakers watching through SPS TV, please call in now to ensure you are on the phone line when your name is called. Board Procedure 1430BP provides the rules for testimony and I ask that speakers are respectful of these rules. I will summarize some important parts of this procedure. First, testimony will take, be taken today from those individuals called from our public testimony list, and if applicable, the waiting list, which are included on today's agenda posting on the school board website. Only those who are called by name should unmute their phones and only one person should speak at a time. Speakers from the list may cede their time to another person when the listed speaker's name is called the total amount of time allowed will not exceed two minutes for the combined number of speakers and time will not be restarted after the new speaker begins. In order to maximize opportunities for others to address the board, each speaker is allowed only one speaking slot per minute. If a speaker cedes time to a later speaker on the testimony list or waiting list, the person to whom the time was ceded will not be called to provide testimony again later in the meeting, as there is only one speaking slot per person. Those who do not wish to have time ceded to them may decline and retain their place on the testimony or wait list. Finally, the majority of the speaker's time should be spent on the topic they have indicated they wish to speak about. Ms. Wilson-Jones will read off the testimony speakers. Thank you, President Hampson. A uh, quick logistical note, speakers, please remain muted until your na name is called to provide testimony. When your name is called, please be sure you have unmuted on the device you are calling from, so unmute on your phone, and also press star six to unmute yourself on the conference call line. Each speaker will have a two minute speaking time and a chime will sound when your time is exhausted and the next speaker will then be called. The first speaker on today's testimony list is Kiasha Rogers. Kiasha Rogers. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, I think that you guys uh, changing the school so there is no longer fossil fuels used is a great idea. It would also probably cause other businesses and other people to use less fossil fuels in their businesses. And also, if you guys are going to end up doing this, I have a suggestion, and that is maybe you guys could um, include like a class about like global warming in like science, because a lot of kids and some adults don't believe in climate change or global warming. And that is a big problem. If they don't believe in it, then they won't grow up to believe in it. But if they do, then they will end up growing up to believe in it. And if we cut back on all these things, it will be less of a problem. And we won't have to worry about the ice melting in Antarctica and everything being underwater. Because scientific shows, science shows that if that ice melts, the water level will be twice as high as the Statue of Liberty. And because of that, nobody would have anywhere to live because they'd just all be homeless because their houses would be underwater. And I don't think anybody wants that to happen, but some people don't believe in climate change, so they don't believe that this will actually happen. But if they do, maybe they'll stop using fossil fuels in their businesses. The smallest thing, can have a giant impact. Thank you. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next is Joseph Sawaya. Joseph Sawaya. Uh, first, I just want to give a brief shout out to the Billy Frank Jr. Day. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. First, I just want to give a brief shout out to the Billy Frank Jr. Uh, 
Day, which is going to be considered on the 24th. Great Snoqualmie tribe activist, uh, treaty rights activist. Now we'd like to play in favor of the uh, Clean Schools Resolution. Um, testimony by uh, one of our students, and then I'll end with a short song. Here's the testimony. Good afternoon. I'm Esther Robertson, and I am in zero support of the 100% climate change resolution as an NYC member and a community member. I implore that all members of the school board stand firmly behind this resolution, or it will benefit us all to think of other energy sources that won't ruin our climate even more. With the influence from the school board, we could gather various departments, community members, or anyone really to move this resolution along faster in this year of 2021. It starts with the schools. I am a fierce advocate for improving the education, and I believe improving the climate will reflect positively on our academic performances. Once we implement a necessity of change in reducing our carbon footprint, I truly believe that not only the youth in our community would want to offer their help, it'll be cities and states and, and then eventually the world. The creation of this resolution has been centered on the engagement and collaboration of this community. And you, the board, are a part of the community. We need you to be working alongside us. Healthy air equals a healthy mind. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Esther Robertson, and I am here in support of the- Sorry, okay, here's the song. We want all clean and green schools. Don't want high carbon mean schools. All I you know we need some climate justice Can't buy no dirty buses Our planet can't go on no more like this You know that our natural gas It show a fossil fuel They're trying to rewash it And play us for food But we can't have it in our schools We want all clean and green food don't want high cotton mean schools. Get rid the fossil fuels for all our kids by 2040 or earlier if we can, and I know that we can. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson next, Jones, next speaker, please. Next is Matt Remley. Matt Remley. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hello? Oh, okay. Hi, my you're name is... Uh, hello? Sorry, you're good. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Matt Rimley. I'm a resident of Beacon Hill and a parent of uh, students in uh, uh, middle school and high school. And uh, likewise, I also want to uh, support the Billy Frank Jr. proposed today and uh, I'm calling in support for the clean energy resolution. And um, I think it is an outstanding step for the uh, Seattle Public Schools to be taking uh, to be a leader in joining alongside uh, the city of Seattle in wanting to phase out uh, fossil fuels. Uh, this uh, is also a step towards equity in that our uh, students in the south end from Beacon Hill, South Park, and Georgetown are disproportionately suffer uh, uh, the uh, impact, health impacts from pollution uh, due to the burning of fossil fuels, which we know impacts both health and uh, uh, abilities uh, within uh, school. So it's uh, also an equity issue. I'd like to thank board members uh, DeWolf and Riviera Smith for their leadership and support and guidance on this and look forward to celebrating the Seattle Public Schools becoming the first school district in the state to pledge to go fossil fuel free. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Jessica Levine. Jessica Levine. Jessica Levine. Hello, this is Jessica Levine. I'm a rep calling in today to support the school board resolution on climate 
change and uh, in support of 100% clean schools. I am a teacher in Seattle Public Schools and a daily bike commuter and science teacher in the district for the last 15 years. And for more than 20 years, I have been educating students about climate impacts and the action they can take. And before I continue, can I just have confirmation I'm being heard? You are. Thank you. Great. Um, and uh, it is time in this resolution for the district to seize a unique opportunity in the global pandemic to make significant changes to their own climate actions. My lessons of climate science and actions for students speak loudly when I hear students like those who spoke today. I followed their lead and took a personal day to march with students over a year ago in the youth climate strike that was global. And this is no longer personal. This must be a community action and Seattle as a city and as a leader in climate action can do so with the district's focus currently at this time with equity. It is high time that the intersectionality of climate justice and environmental justice not only get on the curriculum, but become part of the operations. For more than 30 years, as Greta has told us, and I have studied, the science is crystal clear. Seattle schools needs to step up their leadership into the 21st century. We must listen to our youth. Please act now for a climate future. Please support the 100% Clean Schools Initiative and Resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Brian Terry. Brian Terry. Hi, this is Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. In our schools today, a white student is six times more likely than a black student to be identified as highly capable. District staff told me that although we know who our highly capable black students are, we choose not to identify them because we believe that due to their circumstances, they will not keep up with their white peers and will slow the class down. This is the same argument used in Brown versus the Board of Education to defend racial segregation. It's time for us to move on. It's time for us to believe in our black students, believe that they are capable and deserve equal access to advanced learning and believe the studies that show that academically integrated classrooms provide dramatic benefits to black students with no detriment to white students and believe that as our world grows smaller and our community more diverse, integrated classrooms will benefit all students by providing the opportunity for them to learn the critical skills of how to work with and make friends with people from different backgrounds. Please believe in our black students and insist on equitable, highly capable identification. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ruth Sawyer. Ruth Sawyer. Ruth Sawyer. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ruth Sawyer. I'm an organizer with the Sierra Club. I really appreciate the chance to speak with you all today um, in support of the clean energy resolution. And I also, before I talk about that, want to express my support for the district adopting a Billy Frank Jr. Day and also for the demands put forth by the NAACP Youth Council and Black Lives Matter at school. I am speaking today to ask you to pass the clean energy resolution, which will eliminate all fossil fuels used in heating, cooling, cooking, and transportation by 2040. The science is clear. We have 10 to 12 years to reduce harmful greenhouse gases from the burning of fossil fuels before the impacts of climate change become catastrophic. That's why a lot of school districts across the country, um, including recently Oakland, Salt Lake City, Los Angeles, and many more, are committing to move to 100% clean energy to phase out gas infrastructure and adopt zero emission school buses. By embracing clean electricity and transportation, these proposals put the district on a path to eliminate climate pollution from our operations and improve student health very concretely and academic performance. I want to take a second to emphasize the process that we use to develop this resolution and the many community members and leaders who have given input into the resolution that you have before you. 
More than 25 organizations have endorsed the resolution at this point, and we've gotten input of many more at various stages in the process. I know um, all of uh, you on the board have a list of supporters in the materials, um, and you can also see from that how many people have been deeply involved in shaping the resolution. I also want to add the latest endorsements we've received that are not indicated in those materials. Um, that's from Safe Action Climate Team, Protectors of the Salish Sea, Sand Earth, Washington Environmental Council, King County Executive Dow Constantine, Fridays for Future Seattle, North Seattle College Student Leadership. Um, and that was the end of the list. We urge you to protect our futures by passing this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Chris Jackins. Chris Jackin. My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124. On the West Seattle Elementary Walt Hundley Playfield Parcel Exchange, six points. Number one, this action aims to try to fix a problem caused in 1987 when documents did not get properly filed for a property exchange and the school was built on a portion of the parcel that is still owned by the city parks department. Number two, this 30 year old problem was discovered in connection with current plans to build a new school addition. Number three, on January 6th, the district held an appeal hearing related to environmental review of the project. The district did not disclose the property swap problem. Number four, the next week, the district brought the issue to the board's operations committee. Number five, this means that the environmental review process was tainted. Number six, the board should not vote on this issue until the district redoes the environmental review process. Please vote no. On the Northgate Elementary project, five points. Number one, the district proposes to take away the current large grass playfield and shrink play space by 50%. Number two, the playfield land was provided in 1958 by the Isbell family for $300 with the understanding that it would be kept as a park area. Number three, the district has not seemed motivated to address this issue. Number four, given the situation with the botched West Seattle elementary property swap, it seems that the district may also lack the expertise to address this issue. Number five, please change the Northgate plans to preserve the play field and instead update the existing school. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Richard Voget. Richard Voget. Richard, if you're on the line, you may need to press star six to unmute. Richard Voget. Moving to our next speaker, Sarah Eager Weiler. Sarah Eager or Eager Weiler. Oh, I'm sorry, is that Richard? Do we have Sarah or Richard on the line? This is Sarah Eager Weiler. Can you? Can you hear me now? Um, I think I can hear both of you. Um, can we start with Richard and then we'll move to you, Sarah? Apologies. Yes. This is Sarah. Sorry for the confusion. Sarah, I'll okay. call your name next. Thank you. My name is Rich Bogut and I'm a parent of a student of the 80s and 90s. Here is a statement I have read online. COVID is a pop quiz. Climate change is the final exam. It seems appropriate to use terms like pop quiz and final exam when talking to the school board. With over 472,000 deaths, I think we can agree that the U.S. has failed the pop quiz. Climate change will bring much, much more death and economic devastation if it isn't addressed now. I am encouraged by statements from the new Biden administration that it would treat the climate crisis as emergency that it is, and that every agency is now a part of our climate team. I am asking you to have the Seattle School District be a part of the nation's climate team. 
Therefore, I urge you to pass a clean energy resolution that transitions the district off fossil fuels no later than 2040. One economic benefit to the resolution is that savings from a on-site solar energy and conservation efforts can be redirected into classrooms and student learning. Our daughter Pamela attended Seattle Public Schools from kindergarten through eighth grade when she developed a brain tumor which caused her to walk with a limp and some boys started making fun of her. She died a year after graduating from high school. I tell her story not to rag on Seattle Public Schools, but to remind you that the elderly and children are the ones who die in heat waves, and I don't wish that grief on any parent. Tens of thousands died from COVID because we failed the pop quiz and we didn't take bold action soon enough. I consider their deaths preventable. By passing the clean energy resolution, you can help prevent needless death and suffering. Let's be sure we don't fail the climate, the final exam on climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Next now is Sarah Eggerweiler. Sarah? Can you hear me? We can, yes. Am I heard right now? I'm sorry. I want to make sure I can. I'm heard. Yes, we can hear you, Sarah. Okay. Um, hi, I teach third grade in Seattle and I live in Northgate. Before I go on, I want to also put my support behind a Billy Frank Jr. Day and all demands made by the NAACP Youth Council. In my time as a Seattle teacher, I have also taught first grade and fourth and fifth grade. When I ask my students what they care about, the number one thing they bring up is the environment. Students, especially ones furthest from educational justice, were born into a reality where they have no idea what their future on this planet will look like. Many of them are terrified, angry, and passionate about addressing pollution, litter, or even climate change. I've seen this in my classroom by students, including the one that spoke earlier today. If we are truly, if we truly want to show all of our students that we care about providing an equitable future for them, we need to role model that by following up our statements of equity with actions, including actions of environmental justice, native justice, racial justice, et cetera. As I'm sure all the educators and parents here would agree, students learn by positive examples. And I can say from personal experience, my students do not appreciate when I teach them something that I may not be following myself. Let's show our students that we will lead by example in Seattle. I urge you to pass the resolution to transition Seattle Public Schools to 100% clean energy this year. Thank you. Next is Robin Briggs. Robin Briggs. Robin Hi, can Briggs. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Robin. Okay, great. Um, hi, I also wanted to support the Billy Frank Jr. Day and speak for the um, Clean Energy Resolution. Uh, the Clean Energy Resolution would continue the school's leadership position and sustainability. 100% clean energy seems like an almost insurmountable challenge at the start. I know that for me, as I began to educate myself on the details of how the school buses work, I thought, I don't know how we're going to do this. And as I learned more, I saw opportunities I hadn't guessed at the start and people who are frankly eager to help find solutions. I also realized that there are going to be a lot of subsidiary benefits as well. Electric buses can be parked closer to their routes. Our buses today are driving up from the Duwamish in the morning to start their routes all over the city and then deadheading back again in the afternoon. This adds to the pollution in the area that already gets more pollution than anywhere else. Moreover, inside the bus, it is worse. Pollution measured inside Seattle buses show two to four times more PM 2.5 particles inside the bus than out on the street. Being exposed to these particulates does not enhance children's learning or life expectancy. So we need to switch to electric buses for the climate, but we also need to do it for our health. And when we do this, the school will see big cost savings on operations. The fuel will cost much less. The maintenance is also much less. 
And because the buses won't be deadheading as much, there will be savings in mileage and labor and more predictable arrival times. Of course, there will need to be more funding to make this happen. And I believe the state is ready to help on this. There are a lot of moving parts that will need to come together, but I've been very encouraged by all the people I have met who are motivated to make this happen. We will reap big benefits from this. The kids growing up healthier and better positioned to learn in school, the goodwill the school will build for stepping up and the good example it will set. We'll wonder why we didn't do this a long time ago. Thank you everyone for giving me time to speak. Thank you. Next is Sarah Fenton. Sarah Fenton. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, so my name is Sarah Fenton. I'm a student at North Seattle College. Uh, last year I served as the um, student body president and this year I currently have the opportunity to mentor um, our ASC president, which happens to be a student at Nathan Hale High School. Um, I share this because although I didn't receive my uh, education through public, um, through Seattle Public Schools, I believe that SCS and Seattle colleges um, share community in significant ways. Um, my first summer in Seattle, I was enrolled in a particularly difficult chemistry class, and about two weeks before my finals, as a result of increasing temperatures, uh, wildfires around the state pushed an incredible amount of smoke into our area. As someone with asthma, uh, being functional during those two, uh, those last two weeks of my quarter was difficult, and it significantly impacted my performance in my class. Um, I found my home in Seattle, and when I envision the next 20 years, I want to believe in a future in which my children can participate in learning and life being unburdened by extreme fear due to climate change, which as it stands now is an exist existential crisis. I'm speaking today to urge you to pass the clean energy resolution. Um, all of the student go governing bodies at North Seattle College enthusiastically endorse this resolution. Uh, we believe it's one of the most consequential, compassionate, and strategic moves you can make on behalf of our shared community. Um, we are currently looking at this resolution as a guiding light for pushing for similar resolutions at our institution. Um, I urge Seattle Public Schools to vote yes on this resolution because it not only says something profound about who we are as a community right now, it says something even more consequential about who we can be in the future. Um, given how interconnected climate justice is with Native communities, I want to share my belief as well that adopting a Billy Frank Jr. Day is a strong move towards supporting Native students. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Deepa Sivarajan. Deepa Sivarajan. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Um, my name is Deepa Sivarajan, and I'm the Washington Policy Manager at Climate Solutions, a clean energy nonprofit advocating for policy solutions to the climate crisis. I'm also a former Seattle Public School student from West Seattle, although I graduated quite a while ago. Um, we uh, strongly support this clean energy resolution, which commits the school district to going fossil fuel free by 2040. Um, we thank board directors uh, Lisa Rivera-Smith and Zachary DeWolf for bringing this resolution forward and taking strong leadership on curbing greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution for the students, staff, and teachers at Seattle Public Schools. This resolution is timely. Seattle already faces major climate change impacts, including higher annual temperatures, increased smoke from wildfires, declining snowpack and greater drought risk and more. We need to take bold action and Seattle Public Schools has an important role to play in reducing the, green, the district's greenhouse gas emissions, which will help the city's goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Transportation and buildings are the two largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions in Seattle due to the use of gasoline and diesel to power vehicle, vehicles and the use of natural gas and oil to heat and power buildings. These fossil fuels, as many other folks have mentioned, also increase air pollution, which has um, a disproportionate impact on communities of color, in part due to the historical impacts of segregation and redlining that have led folks to be pushed to live in places like South Seattle that already have greater exposure to air pollution. The good news is, like Robin Briggs mentioned earlier, research shows that school districts that have lo lowered their diesel and gas emissions from fossil fuels have seen improvements in student health and overall learning outcomes. By passing this resolution, which would move the district's buildings and vehicles off fossil fuels, the board has the opportunity to protect the health and safety of students, staff, teachers, and more, as well as working to mitigate climate change. 
And I just want to add as well that, um, as many other speakers have mentioned, um, in keeping with a commitment to uh, Native justice and Indigenous justice, um, we also support the, the Billy Frank Jr. resolution and are happy to see that coming forward today. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Heather Price. Heather Price. Hello? We can hear you, Heather. Heather? Oh, are you there, Heather? Heather, Heather Price. Hi. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Heather Price, and I'm calling in support of the Clean Energy Resolution and also to support um, the Billy Frank Jr. Day. Um, so I'm a parent. I'm also a climate scientist and chemistry professor, and I've mentored Nathan Hale High School students in their uh, climate action days uh, the past uh, two years. Uh, my PhD is in chemistry, and I focused on air pollution, and my postdoctoral research is in atmospheric chemistry uh, from University of Washington's program on climate change. And I first want to start off by saying that as a scientist and an educator, I don't believe in climate change. I'm a scientist. I understand the science, and I understand the impacts of fossil-fueled climate change on what's happening right now in our world and what our children and our communities, particularly those that are most vulnerable, are going to be facing and are already facing, such as the summertime smoke that we're seeing. Um, and also, I want to uh, support uh, uh, Kiasha Rogers and what she said about including climate um, in our schools and not just in the science. I'm a chemistry professor, and I think it's a mistake to leave teaching climate just in the sciences. Climate touches every part of our lives and it belongs in every subject. It belongs in history and English and uh, all of our courses, drama, art. Um, and the science of uh, air pollution and climate are clear and the impacts on our children and particularly the impacts um, on communities that live near bus barns who ride the toxic diesel buses are clear. A recent study from Harvard finds that fossil fuel pollution, this study just came out last week, fossil fuel pollution kills 8 million people per year. That's about one in five deaths worldwide. So continuing to burn fossil fuels when we have the technology in hand to transition off and the economic means to assist affected workers is downright immoral. Uh, the Seattle Public Schools Board has an opportunity to take a step in moving away from fossil fuels to cleaner electricity. And I hope that uh, they, you will take the opportunity to uh, vote for that resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Vanessa Meraki. Vanessa Meraki. Vanessa Meraki. You may need to press star six to unmute on the conference call line. Vanessa Meraki. Okay, moving to our next speaker, Sabrina Burr. Sabrina Burr. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Sabrina Burr with Seattle hear me? Council PCS. Hello? You're good, Sabrina. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Sabrina Burr with Seattle Council PTSA. Seattle Council PTSA District 7 in Southeast Seattle engaged as a collective of parent leaders under our Southeast Director O'Hara Jimenez. We work closely with our school board director, Brandon Hersey, almost weekly since summer of 2020. We are a collective of parents who work closely on the behalf of our constituents. We demand a commitment and action to pursuing meaningful and authentic family engagement from Seattle Public Schools. This afternoon, the board, superintendent, and small cabinet received an email from us. You will find some data of our reopening survey 
still open currently with 452 responses. We ask that you all read this letter for further details and those requested to join us as our next meeting on February 23rd, um, join us for final results and authentic engagement. Time and time again, we have seen short-sighted decisions made by the district with a lack of meaning authentic engagement, and we need this to change. Southeast Seattle is our most diverse district who is prioritizing the strategic plan. Our students, families, and our community bear the brunt of these effects for many years after. Families feel tired and defeated by the system, and they are used to their voices not making a difference and that must change. Institutional racism and systemic oppression create a sense of fear and scarcity, especially for black, native, and people of color and our immigrant communities. If the global pandemic and the national racial justice awakening has taught us anything, it is that we do not want to go back to the way things were. And the risk of continuing to move forward to do business as usual is too great. Now is the time to dismantle white supremacy structures um, and, and the culture to be an organization that does not stop at access and inclusion, but generally seek for racial equity organization led by the voices of our students and families. We demand this imperative transformation for equitable outcomes for all. Southeast Seattle families are ready and willing to support and partner with Seattle public schools in meaningful ways. Let us start a new culture of partnerships that centers black, native, people of color voices, led by the desires and dreams of our youth and our families. As Brent Jones always says, we are a Seattle public schools family. Let us act and truly be one and look out for our most vulnerable members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. Um, stepping back to Vanessa Meraki, I believe. Is it possible for me to have my time? The, is this the phone Vanessa? Kick me out. Is this Vanessa? Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Vanessa. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Vanessa Meraki. I'm a veteran Seattle Public Schools teacher. I currently teach third grade at Emerson Elementary. So my students are the class of 2030, the deadline year for the changes we need to make to avoid climate change hellscape. And I'm also a parent of two STS graduates. It's on behalf of my sons and my students that I speak today. I would like to thank directors Rivera Smith and DeWolf for bringing forward the clean energy resolution and urge the board to pass it unanimously and implement it without delay. This represents the minimum SPS must do to meet its moral obligation to this moment. This resolution must be just the beginning. We need to back up resolutions with leadership and infrastructure. A fierce commitment to sustainability and climate action must be a litmus test for the new superintendent. And we need to hire a director of sustainability for the district. Having this leadership in place will allow SPS to unify, coordinate, and mandate sustainability efforts across departments and district-wide. We need to adopt a sustainability analysis tool, similar to the racial equity analysis tool we use, that is applied to every decision in every department. And we need to place climate and sustainability education at the center of instruction by mandating professional development, providing curricular tools, and including sustainability and climate action as a section in the CSEP. It is irresponsible to keep educating students in ways of thinking and acting that have gotten us to this global emergency. Students need the facts about energy, ecosystems, and engineering, and they also need a fundamental sense of responsibility to the web of life and to regenerative principles. As an anchor institution, SPS has the power to take bold action to protect the soil, water, air, and future for next generations. Nothing is more urgent than this. Let's pass this resolution right away and then take immediate steps to make climate action and sustainability the unifying story of Seattle Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sean Alice Hubbard. Sean Alice Hubbard. Hello, my name is Sean Hubbard. My sisters and I were students at Northgate Elementary in the late 50s and 60s. Our mother still lives in our family's home, which shares the same block with the school. I and others recently testified at the hearing to appeal the DNS for the Northgate School Replacement Project. We are requesting an EIS because we know that the impacts will be significant 
and we are the ones who will have to live with them. On this project, we neighbors and taxpayers have had scant say in what happens in our own backyard. A late in the game, SEPA appeal is not a stellar example of community engagement. Starting with the levy, where did it explain in the voters pamphlet, your neighborhood school will be demolished, your green space and views taken away, and replaced with a doubled in size building and a whole bunch of unpleasant impacts will come from this. I wouldn't have voted for that. Only one neighbor from 120th Street participated in the SDAT meetings. Was that neighbor supposed to represent the entire neighborhood? And the Duwamish people were not consulted on the natural resources report. This is their land and an oversight is no excuse. Their voices should be heard. In anticipation of levy dollars, schools hired an architecture firm to design a master plan. An employee from the same firm also chairs the landmarks board Due to a conflict of interest, this chair should have recused himself from arguing the denial of landmark status to Northgate and other levy schools planned for demolition. Schools is taking away a play field from the whole community, and it is irreplaceable. As our only accessible green space, it is the village green for a diversifying neighborhood. The King County Open Space Equity Cabinet would say that the schools is going in the wrong direction. Please do a full environmental review and consider alternatives on the Northgate project. And please improve the public participation process. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Giselle Jenkins. Giselle Jenkins. Hello? We can hear you. Okay. Hi, I'm Giselle, a sophomore from Ingram High School and a descendant from the Aleut tribe. I believe SPS needs to make a change, namely to increase representation and celebration of Native Americans within their schools. Having Billy Frank Jr. Day celebrated in my school would bring a great deal and change needed by recognizing and honoring a Coast Salish hero who did a great deal of indigenous community here for the indigenous community here in Washington. Interns from UNEA created a petition to advocate for SPS to recognize and celebrate Billy Frank Jr. Day officially every March 9th. These are some of the reasons community members provided for why they signed the petition to pass Billy Frank Jr. Day. I'm signing this because Billy Frank Jr.'s courage to fight for treaty rights, environmental revitalization and conservation, tribal sovereignty and social justice. We must protect the sacred and the indigenous people must lead. Representation matters, even more so that the indigenous members of our community who are so often ignored, erased, dirated, and dirated. This action is being asked of us by the indigenous youth. It is not enough, but it is a start. We need to do better to listen from those whose lands we occupy. It is important to recognize pay tribute to and learn from the indigenous community that has shaped our country and the PNW in particular. Billy Frank Jr. Day to me represents a pioneer who brought salmon to my dinner table. We should all be grateful for his efforts we depend on today. My hope is we continue to foster his beliefs to our young so they can provide sustenance for the people tomorrow. Billy Frank Jr. is a modern day hero and we all need to know his dynamic leadership and activism. I, Giselle Jenkins, urge SPS to listen to the words of the community to support this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sarah Sense Wilson. Sarah Sense Wilson. Sarah Sense Wilson. You may need to press star six to unmute if you are on the line. Sarah Sense Wilson, if you want to press star six one more time, sometimes it takes multiple tries. Okay, moving to the next speaker, uh, Brooke Stromy. Brooke Stromy.
Is that Brooke? Yes. Um, Sarah is on the line. She'll, she can go after me, but I cede my time to Kayla Harstad. Go ahead, Kayla. Hello? Is that Kayla? Um, yeah, can you hear me? We can, yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Kayla Harstad. I'm Turtle Mountain Chippewa and Assiniboine Sioux. I'm a junior here at Ingram, and I'm here to advocate for Seattle Public Schools to designate March 9th as Billy Frank Junior Day. I would love for my culture to be celebrated through a person who is seen as inspiration to this day. I want to feel the joy and pride of one of our heroes being celebrated school-wide on an annual basis. I want to be taught about Indigenous resilience and contribution, success, and triumphs. Not only should this day be celebrated by Indigenous students, but other communities as well. The Billy Frank Junior Day Resolution, which was crafted by UNIA Youth and Internship Leadership, calls for supporting the designation of March 9th as a day of remembrance, celebration, and recognition in honor of life, legacy, and achievements of Billy Frank Jr. in Esqually Nation. Billy Frank Jr.'s courage and dedication to fight for community rights is an inspiration to many across the nation. It is important for more people to know about Billy Frank Jr. and his story. Billy Frank Jr. was a visionary who believed in environmental conservation, protecting the salmon, managing and restoring water rights, and revitalizing ecosystems to promote clean water for healthy sea life. The Salmon Defense Fund provides K-12 BFJ Day curriculum on a variety of relevant themes on treaty rights, tribal sovereignty, social justice, environmentalism, and cultural traditional values in Indigenous worldwide. This valuable curriculum could be utilized each March 9th by teachers and staff. I urge the Seattle Public School Board to support our effort in designating March 9th as Billy Frank Jr. Day. This would be a critical step towards making Indigenous students feel included and comfortable within a space where they are supposed to feel welcomed. It is more important now than ever for Seattle Public Schools to celebrate the first peoples of this land. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Sens Wilson, are you on the line now? Sarah Sens Wilson. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay, great. The UNEA's concerns related to victim training data have exponentially escalated after the survey initial evidence and support markers. Most suspected and anticipated given the documented record of inappropriate abuse of power and direct harm against black and brown students, families, and community. Lincoln uh, Springs Native Focus K-8 Option School has historically supported a significant number of special ed foster adopted unsheltered students of color and was a magnet school for urban American Indian students. We are at utter dismay. SPS would reward the motive bad actors back into leadership at a native focused alternative school. Even rewarding incompetent leaders who abuse power in front of black and brown students, staff, and community helps explain why SBS has become a national model of public failure. We have been receiving a steady stream of evidence that this bad actor continues abusive practices at Lincoln Springs. There's a significant number of exodus um, a valued, experienced, and cherished educators and staff and BIPOC students from Lipton Springs. Racist leadership results in bad outcomes for BIPOC students. SPS board is intent on eliminating option school. We are seeing an aggressive dismantling at the hands of elected public leaders. Our children are sacred. Our families matter. And our communities unwilling to step aside while you experiment with your misguided theories and colonial practices. We will mobilize and we will take back our public education system. Thank you. Thank you. The final speaker on today's public testimony list is Rima Mera. Rima Mera. Rima, if you're on the line, you need to press star six to unmute. And it can take a couple tries. Rima, Mera.
Again, you need to press star six if you're on the line, Rima. President Hampson, that was the final speaker on today's list. OK, just pause momentarily in case Rima uh, comes up as I move into the next part of our agenda. Uh, still not there, Rima. OK, uh, we now move to the action items on today's agenda. And moving first now to action item number one, resolution 2020-21-18, transitioning Seattle public schools to 100% clean and renewable energy. This came through operations committee on January 14th for consideration. And I have a motion for this item. Oh, I'm sorry. And just a note, uh, our vice president, um, Director Hersey, joined us at 346. Go ahead, Director Hersey. Director Hersey, are you there? Yes, sorry, my computer is pulling up the talking points. I'm getting a little spinning wheel. Uh, can I just do a so move for right now while it is opening? Oh, well, uh, Director Vera Smith, can you make the motion? Of course. Um, I move this, that the school board approve resolution 2020-21-18, committing South Public Schools to transitioning the district to 100% clean renewable energy as attached to this board action report. Second. Second. This motion has been moved by Director Vera Smith and seconded by Director DeWolf. And now we will go uh, to directors with any comments or questions, um, starting first with the chair of the operations committee and one of the uh, co-sponsors of this resolution, uh, Director DeWolf. Thank you so much, President Hampson. Thank you, Director Vera Smith, uh, for, for moving this motion. I just I don't want to spend too much time. I know we've we've certainly spoken about this resolution over the past uh, couple of months um, in several committees uh, and also here at the full board. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be really transparent during our public comment portion today. I was getting pretty choked up. I was crying. Um, I think it really just speaks to the fact that um, this was such an incredibly humbling, beautiful community effort. And I just want to um, just you know raise my hands up to the, nu the, the, the number of students we had, the, the community members, environmental folks, uh, families, educators, and especially to Ruth Sawyer from Sierra Club and Lisa Oyos from Climate Parents. Um, this is a huge day uh, for their work. Uh, it's, an, it's the culmination of many months of working together in collaboration. Uh, and, and I just want to give special thanks to Director Vera Smith. Um, as soon as she got on the board, we, we got to work with, on ideas probably in December uh, 2019, January 2020, before everything uh, happened with the pandemic and the shutdown. So we've certainly been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and I want to just give a special note to our students. Uh, back in, this is an old story for board directors, but I know we have some new folks here today, which is to say that back in J June 2019, I was able to to be a part of the Garfield High School graduation ceremony and the valedictorians there, there were 18 of them, uh, gave a shared speech. And in that shared speech, they implored uh, all of the adults who were listening um, to, to, to look in the mirror at themselves, to recognize that they have not done enough to avert or address the climate crisis that is literally at our doorstep and, and holding all the adults responsible for the future we are graduating them into. Um, those students made a, a huge imprint and an impact on me. Um, their voice, their passion, their concern, their urgency, their stress, their fears um, have made it, have been imprinted on my heart and have been working on this resolution with them in mind. And so I say to all of our students, thank you for holding us adults accountable. I hope you see the, the power that you have when you come together to build something really wonderful that not only will be beneficial today, but for generations to come. Um, I think after today, we'll be able to celebrate what we've, what we've done here, but we have a lot of work ahead of us. So I, I think that even though this felt like a lot of work, it is likely the easiest part of this journey. And so I, I ask all of the folks that are listening who worked on this 
um, to not only hold the district accountable, make sure that we are working on this implementation plan uh, efficiently and urgently, and to continue to engage with the district to make sure that this is a really strong commitment and we adhere to it um, because we owe it to our, our young people, our students, and our own futures, and the future of this planet. And so I'll turn it over to other directors with any questions you have for, for Director Vera Smith and myself or any of the staff who helped work on this. Um, but it's a real special day and I'm so proud to be a part of the Seattle School District School Board. Thank you, Director DeWolf. And uh, I'll just note for the those listening that I did um, inadvertently skip the committee reports on the agenda and we will go back to that after this uh, action item. So um, with that, I'm going to go to Director Hersey uh, for questions, comments. Yeah, so I have had the opportunity to, oh, let me hit my camera. I've had the opportunity to, with, to speak with Director DeWolf um, about this at several intersections. I'm just really thankful for the work that's gone into it. I don't have any questions or comments. Uh, well, I guess I do have one comment. I would just say that as we move forward, um with this potentially tonight i just echo the amount of accountability that it is going to take of our system to continue to push right because this cannot only be a movement that is taken by the board so we are going to need students especially but families community fellow government um fellow government folks to be in this hand in hand with us and to not only encourage but also continue to hold us accountable to this aim because if we don't then we we are really setting up future generations for a planet that is just ultimately going to be in uninhabitable so thank you for all the work that's gone into it and i'm excited to vote in favor of this measure Thank you, Director Hersey. Uh, and now moving to Director uh, Director Harris. Has Director Harris joined us? Uh, so we'll go next to Director River uh, Director River Smith. Do you want to? I know you're co-sponsor, but please uh, go ahead with your comments or. Hi, yeah, no, I definitely uh, support it all the way. It's been an exciting process to work with the community to make this resolution happen and bring it to here, bring it to the board um, for action tonight. Um, you know, it's it's the community who spoke tonight couldn't have said it better. I really appreciate everyone who came out to support it and show that this is a commitment that we're all excited to be making and to lead the way as we as we heard um as somebody I think kind of shared there even a seattle colleges is looking to do a resolution similar to this to join other school districts such as um, oakland unified school district los angeles unified school district and salt lake city so um we're joining a good crowd and we're making this happen tonight hopefully <laughs> I, I really appreciate um director dewolf's um leadership in this um and sawyer from the Sierra Club, uh, Lisa Oyo's Climate Parents, and all the fact the we had staff, students, community members all taking part in this, and it's been it's been remarkable. And um, thank you all for your support. And that takes us to Director Rankin. Hi, um, I will just say a huge thank you to my colleagues for um, bringing this forward and. Uh, bringing so many community members into this process uh, is really um, an exciting uh, showing that, you know, we as board directors are here to represent the community. And so it's always really exciting to see when it kind of, you know, comes forward the way that it should in collaboration and in partnership with community members. Um, I think, you know, a lot of our, our testimony speakers said said it best um, why this is so important. Um, so I won't I won't uh, um, belabor uh, my enthusiastic support too much. But I just want to add um, in particularly particular I appreciated the comment by a student about uh, curriculum related to this. Um, this is a really exciting opportunity uh, you know to make sure that even though uh, operationally transitioning to clean and renewable energy is a huge benefit to our students. Uh, the, you know, the the meaning and impact that it has for them in their lives and as as future adults and as current students is 
we, we have uh, exciting potential to connect, uh, you know, students to their physical place and also their physical building. I think any any opportunity we have to sort of show our students um, in it, uh, how um, things work in their building. I mean, the thermal thermal energy that's happening in some buildings is really exciting, and I I hope that students that are at those schools understand how that works and why it's exciting and and why it's important and um kind of any any way we can make that more more transparent and accessible to students um in addition to the greater community is really exciting so uh just huge thanks and um this is definitely the right thing to do at this point in time and um going forward thank you director rankin okay and unless uh director harris has uh, since joined us, um, that comes to me for comments and questions. And uh, I, as I stated in our prior meeting when this came through for intro, I really appreciated the opportunity as a director to connect uh, directly with uh, community um, that were engaged in uh, working with directors to put this together. Um, it was a very uh, in, um, productive and engaged conversation and in particular mm -hmm. appreciate um, the, the aspects that we talked about that were priorities for me as it pertains to this um, relative to procurement and the um, the concept of uh, place-based learning and the role that that that, that plays um, and extending the notion of, of this um, uh, getting to this more conscientious place beyond just what we do within Seattle Public Schools, but to those that we interact with. And, and um, um, that gets really does get us to the mindset that um, we need to have um, when it comes to uh, how we utilize the resources around us to sustain ourselves. So, um, so hands up to all of you, um, as they say in Coast Salish country, um, for this very, very good work. Uh, Pina Gigi um, from um, uh, in my Ho-Chunk language. And then I do have one question and then also need to, um, I know Director DeWolf has a couple of um, additional people I know he wants to um, add to the to the bar so that they're um, um, uh, memorialized in this work. Um, and then my my one question is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a question um, that is probably most likely answered in the context of the task force, but I, I hope that you'll um, hear it and consider it going forward. And that is that the way that the fiscal analysis reads, um, it has a lot of uh, really big numbers relative to the transition, the, the actual cost of transitioning to a different way of, of utilizing energy. And what I would encourage you to do is to look at that going forward um, for the task force to make sure that those things are always brought back to the board in terms of any additional cost also um, couched within the perspective long-term savings, right? So that, that is the full um, equation that of um, uh, not just the, um, the dollars that it takes to do a given project, but if we have to replace, you know, let's say a school bus that we don't own the school buses anyway, that um, that if you're replacing it with a more eco-friendly um, version, um, a, an electric version, um, that you're, you're maybe you're paying additional for that electric option, um, but it's not the full cost, right? And then um, even and then how long does it take to recoup that additional cost? And so that's what I think is going to be really important when when this comes back over time. Um, that that it's able that is provided in those kinds of financial terms. I think that's going to really um, uh, help the success of this. And so I don't know if you wanted to respond to that at all, Director DeWolf, and or anybody else um, here from community or uh, Director Vera Smith. If not, that's fine. I would just ask that you um, have that strong note for the task force, and then um, would ask you to go ahead and make your comments about who else you want to memorialize. Thank you, Director Hampson. I think that's really great. And um, certainly uh, I will work with, uh, I, I would imagine that the operations committee will support that process, whether just advising or in any way. So I will certainly take that um, feedback. So thank you for, for elevating that. Um, I wanted to address a couple of things that came up from students and a couple of speakers around curriculum. 
Uh, about a year ago, I actually asked the question around what are we teaching around the climate crisis in our schools and was assured at that time, at, at the time by Chief DeBacker, that we do teach about the climate crisis in uh, our science curriculum right now. So it's not across the board in all of our, you know, all of our uh, different subjects, but but understand that particularly in the new science that we approved recently over the course of the last few years, I can't remember the, the, the year, I think it was 2019. Um, so just to share that, that that curriculum is uh, inclusive of, of that topic, as well as we just approved a new course catalog in January that includes uh, global warming course A and B. So I just want to that, that we, are, we are thinking about this issue and have this course um, uh, elsewhere. And then I also just wanted to uh, share that uh, maybe Greg or Ellie for adding the additional folks, with the Faith Action Climate Team, the Protectors of the Salish Sea, the King County Executive Dow Constantine, Fridays for Future Seattle and North Seattle College Student Leadership. Is there something I need to do, offer an amendment, or can I, how do I add those, those names um, before we move, move to the vote momentarily? Uh, Ellie, do you want to take that? If, if, if these are being added to the version that was posted, uh, it seems that just an amendment uh, listing them and indicating where they go would be in order for the version that's passed in this meeting. Do you agree with that? Um, Director DeWolf, are these uh, additions to the board action report? Yeah. So just We're, when... Correct. They, these are just new folks that have... Um, so one note for you is that we don't, um, at the end of a, an amendment, um, in, sort of engross the changes in the board action report. So um, you could offer it as amendment to the board action report, and then the record of that board action report will be the minutes plus what was posted. Um, you could also, um, if you want to, uh, you know, um, recognize the contributions of those organizations, um, also just ask that your comments be included in the minutes. So, so either way. I guess I wasn't clear if it was going in the resolution or the the board action report. It's just the bar. Just the oh, bar. okay. All right. No, then then what Ellie said. Sorry. Oh, okay. So I would just can I offer an amendment to add these five names to the bar? Is that okay, President Hampson? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. I move to add Faith Action Climate. Team, protectors of the Village C, King County Executive Dow Constantine, Fridays for Future Seattle, and North Seattle College Student Leadership to the Board Action Report under the Community Engagement section, specifically along with the other organizations and individuals listed who endorsed this resolution. Can I get a second for that second. amendment? Second. Okay, this amendment was uh, moved by Director DeWolf and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. I believe you have the text in a um, written form, um, Director Wilson-Jones. I do, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and let's see, can I do all this in favor or do we need a roll call on the amendment? I can call, I can call the roll on that for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director DeWolf. Aye. And then I do not believe we have Director Harris with us yet. So, Director Hersey? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera Smith? Aye. And Director Hampson? Aye. The amendment has passed unanimously. And so, just a reminder um, you will, at the end of the process, need a new motion to move the underlying item as amended. Yes, and I believe we are ready for that. So, Director um, Percy, would you mind moving the uh, motion as amended? Yeah. Um, can again, so like I've got the original motion here. Can I just say as amended because I'm not yes. sure what the names yes. are? Okay. So, I move that the Seattle School Board approve resolution 2020 2118 committing Seattle Public Schools to transitioning the district to 100% clean renewable energy as attached to this board action report as amended. Second. Okay, this amended motion has been made by Director Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. Ms. Wilson, please call the roll. 
Director DeWolf? Proudly, yes. Director, um, we do not have Director Harris. Director Hersey? Yes. Director Rankin? Absolutely, yes. Director Rivera Smith? Yes. Director Hampson? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Good work, congratulations. Okay, um, you, and Julie. so now I'm going to move us back to um, our committee reports. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones, and we'll go next to, we already heard from operations, so we'll go next to curriculum and instruction. Student supports curriculum and, and instruction, Dir Director Rankin, committee chair. Thank you. Um, so we had our uh, February committee meeting on the 2nd of this month. And I'm just gonna kind of go through and kind of hit the hit the high points. Um, we are continuing to uh, get updates and opportunities to uh, give feedback on the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook um, for next year. And again, I wanna express my appreciation to staff for um, uh, continuing to bring that to committee uh, earlier than has been done in the past and more frequently. It's really great. And uh, just a reminder to my fellow directors, and I'm happy to forward you the materials again, that um, you know we'll be voting on this eventually. So now's the time to look over it and see if there's anything that, that you uh, want to talk about. Um, we also, in the consent agenda, just approved the uh, highly capable um, highly capable plan for the current year, and that is a, uh, a requirement by the state to be funded. So the the state requires um, or considers uh, highly capable uh, services, uh, basic education, and so we have to submit uh, uh, the outline of how those services are being provided um, to the state every year. It's not a plan for the future. It's sort of a current and, and backwards look a little bit. But the reason I bring that up is, is because um, I just wanted to especially thank and recognize staff for um, in the update that they gave us talking about uh, work being done to um, identify better ways, uh, more equitable ways to um, identify highly capable students and also make a special note that uh, uh, of appreciation for staff connecting with um, families who are currently being served in the cohort um, as uh, changes to the program are being made to make it more accessible to more students in more places. And so I just appreciate uh, that check-in with um, families who are currently in because my hope is that um, we can all uh, work together in support of making sure that these services are not taken away from students, but but are being made more accessible to more students um, uh, to advanced and highly capable learning. Um, we are in the process right now of looking through, or the district is in the process right now of, uh, um, of selecting screeners, dyslexia screeners that have been approved by the approved by the state or by OSPI. Um, so that is exciting to see that moving along. Um, what else? Um, great to be making more progress on ethnic studies and hiring staff, and I look forward to uh, having the opportunity to talk more about that publicly in a work session in March. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, um, yeah, no, I think that's it for now. Thanks. OK, thank you, uh, Director Rankin. And we'll new move now to uh, Audit and Finance Committee Chair, Director Hersey. Thank you very much. Um, so our last meeting was mostly focused around our budgetary constraints, especially in regard, oh, I keep forgetting my camera. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Um, so our last meeting was mostly focused around the budgetary restraints that we have in regard to not only transportation, but the various other factors that are impacting the financial health of our district. Um, <clears throat> what I would say is this is an ever evolving situation. There are a couple of specific bills that are moving through the legislature right now um, that would help us get to a place to where we could uh, reasonably um, move forward with 
opening physical buildings, not necessarily reopening schools, because we have been doing school ever since we closed last March. So I would just like to say that um, as we continue to move forward, please be on the lookout for bills 5128 and 5344. Uh, the first one is for transportation and the other one is for um, <clears throat> various funding and uh, in terms of ESER specifically. Um, what I would say is please, if you are interested in returning to physical buildings for um, potentially this year, or maybe even in the fall, please reach out to your legislators and make sure that you are uh, advocating for the support of those two bills. Again, that bill is 5128 and 5344. We would greatly appreciate it. I look forward to the opportunity to chat with you all at the next audit and finance committee meeting, and I will pass it on to the next director. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Hersey, uh, and I will now move to the executive committee um, meeting. Uh, the most recent of one was this morning, uh, February 10th. Uh, next one um, will be on March 17th. Uh, and uh, pretty exciting um, morning this morning and that we discussed. Uh, thank you, Directors Hersey and uh, DeWolf the uh, prospect of bringing students onto our school board, uh, not as, as voting members, as state law doesn't allow for that, but as full um, participatory uh, members of the board. And so um, I'm excited to see us uh, continue to move that forward and um, had some, some very good, uh, robust conversation and fantastic presentations from students themselves who um, have very much been a part of driving this, this process and, and brought it forward uh, first. Um, and then um, we looked again at our updates, ongoing updates to um, our website as we, we try to look to a new uh, content management system. Um, discussed our upcoming uh, March board retreat, which is critical for those that want to listen into that. That's on, on March um, 6th, and that will be um, starting at 8.30 a.m. Uh, and will be heavily focused on our in-person learning design um, for uh, primarily for, for fall. Um, and um, talked about conference schedules, conference opportunities uh, relative to our board goals and encourage directors to respond when you receive the emails about um, opportunities to participate uh, not just in conferences but in opportunities to learn ar around best practices and um, always happy to hear from folks in community if you know of opportunities um, I, I different states definitely provide opportunities for growth um, and uh, leadership uh, development for school board directors in very different ways from state to state. And um, I, it's they can be a bit hard to find here within Washington state. And um, so um, I hope that folks will, will do what they can to um, take advantage of those opportunities. There are more of them now because they're remote and so we're able to actually access them without traveling. Um, so there'll be an email coming out about that. And then the district for appoint school director, um, board director appointment process. Um, we were scheduled to have a meeting on the 25th to narrow that down to five, um, but we had a, our sixth candidate dropped out. So we are now down to um, five directors, uh, five um, applicants for the um, district four uh, position. And we will be moving forward with that process. Um, and I believe um, while there are resumes and their um, responses um, to um, some initial questions are available now, there will also be videos um, that will be uh, posted soon. And um, I, th I think we're hoping by the end of this week, um, Ms. Wilson-Jones will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and we're looking forward to that will all be done um, by the March 24th meeting is when we will have that that final decision and there will be a forum um, before that. Um, uh, I believe led primarily by the NAACP Youth Coalition will be uh, moderating that forum for us. Um, 
and then we talked about uh, bringing folks in once that's done um, board member orientation and kind of the direction that we need to go for that to make sure that board members are as prepared as possible um, when they come on to the job. So with that, I will um, then move us on to the uh, next action item. Sorry again for being a bit out of order. Um, and that next action item uh, is BEX 5 approval of budget transfer and construction change order number five for the West Seattle High School um, re replacement project. May I have a motion? This came through operations on February 4th for approval. May I have a motion for this item? Absolutely. I move that the school board approve the transfer in the amount of $1,900,000 from the BEX 5 program contingency to the West Seattle High School roof replacement project budget and authorize the superintendent to approve construction change order number five with Wayne's Roofing Incorporated in the amount of $1,500,000 plus Washington State sales tax. With any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement both the fund transfer and construction change order, immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second. This motion, this item has been moved by uh, Director Hersey and seconded by Director Vera Smith. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Uh, Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta, I believe you will be briefing us. Yes, uh, thank you, President Hampson, and I, I appreciate quick consideration on the part of the board of this action. Um, Superintendent Juno mentioned power outages in her remarks at the beginning of the meeting and our uh, efforts to refine our practices. And the reason we had recent experience is in the evening of January 12th and the early morning hours of January 13th, there was a severe windstorm, um, went through the Seattle area with wind gusts of 50 to 70 miles per hour. And um, at West Seattle High School, a portion of um, our uh, steel roof over the gymnasium locker rooms um, tore off the building. And um, following that, we did a an inspection of uh, the roof, the steel seam roof over the gymnasium and found that uh, many of the panels um, were not properly fastened to the building and that we uh, are at risk at, in, at during another storm or big weather event of more damage, um, which really can create safety impacts for occupants or people near the building, not to mention the other damage it can do to our facility. So none of that, of course, is good news, but um, there, if there's any luck to be had here, um, we are um, doing a major roofing project at West Seattle High School, repairing parts of the historic clay roof and other sections of um, steel roof. This particular section had been installed in 2001 and was not part of this project, but the silver lining, if you will, in here is that we have a, um, uh, excellent roofing contractor on site working on the roof um, and who is familiar with our buildings and can help us with this emergency repair and we have a project in place um, that will allow us to um, uh, deploy resources which will be efficient since the project is started up and we have also um, purchased these services through a purchasing cooperative which really allows us to understand the costs at a kind of a unit cost level. So while this is not a, a positive event overall, I think we're you know fortunate that we're postured to attend to it right away, to attend to the risk, um, to not have to stand up an emergency project and um, that we can use program and project con, uh, contingency budgets to um, facilitate um, these repairs. Um, and that's why we've asked for this to be um, introduce and acted upon in this meeting so we can um, strike while the iron is hot, as it were. And um, I think that is kind of the general background. I'd be happy to entertain questions. I'm also joined by Capital Projects and Planning Director um, Richard Bess, who uh, can give, provide any technical details, given that um, we're not giving the board um, much time to think about this. I ask Richard to join us in case you have any questions about the project itself. So thank you. Okay, we'll go first to committee chair, Director DeWolf.
Director Dewell. Thank you, uh, President oh. Hampson. Yep, thank you, President Hampson. Uh, I don't have any questions. I appreciate the, the background, uh, Chief Podesta. We uh, talked about this extensively in our operations committee meeting on Thursday. So I think this is a just a smart thing. We need to do it. And it, and that actually seems um, kind of like kismet that, that there was somebody already there working on it. And so uh, we can kind of just fold this into the work. So excited to support this um, and uh, we'll let the next director go. Director Hersey. No questions for me. Director um, Harris, I believe you joined us at 5.07 approximately. Oh, I thought it was 5 o'clock. I want to watch any event. No questions for me on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director uh, Rivera-Smith. Um, no, no questions. Thank you. I, I appreciate that we can do this expediently. And, um, and thank you, Fred and Richard, for uh, the information tonight. Director Rankin. I do not have any further questions. Um, had a good discussion in committee, and I um, am glad that even though this is a bit of a hiccup that we uh, discovered it in a in a that, that nothing horrible horrible happened that we discovered that this needed to be secured and and can take care of it so it's good and then i think my only question was just in terms of um because this happened uh in in the way that it did um and that there was because of the historic uh nature that there you had to use the purchasing cooperative um as the alternative procurement method was there any other um anything in particular within that that where we had to have any exceptions relative to our normal procedure other than the historic piece of it I, I think it was convenient for us to manage the details of construction methods and um to on the portion of the project that related to the clay tile roof i i think other than that um those are convenient for us in managing kind of on a time and materials basis and understanding details. Richard, if you have anything you'd like to add about our, our procurement method, I, I think it's also um, for this particular situation with the change order, it is very helpful to us that um, we can only pay for the portions that we need to take care of now and kind of, again, pay a little bit more on a time and materials basis, not do a design and a bid and um, take the kind of total project approach to dealing with an emergency where we'll discover kind of on the as the course of work proceeds what the true cost will be i think it was, will help us manage costs well and anything you'd like to add richard i'd appreciate yeah no i think fred you've actually given a very good explanation of what we what the actions we're taking uh president hampson we are coordinating with the city of seattle's department of neighborhoods and landmark preservation board um, any activity that occurs within 200 feet on our site within the landmarked uh, areas, we do have to coordinate with them. So we've informed uh, their administrator um, uh, of this work that we're taking and the actions that we're doing and our architectural firm is doing that on behalf of Seattle Public Schools. I will note, um, I am thankful we have a purchasing cooperative uh, that we utilize that procurement method because it does have line item pricing and we're able to go to those line items. And this is literally almost per dollar the same as the standing seam metal roof that we did um, replace um, as part of the phase two work. This was the only portion of the roof, th this, this roof that we're talking about in this change order was the only portion of the roof that was not addressed in either phase one or phase two, thinking that it had significant life left in it. And so I think Fred's done a great job of uh, describing the problem and the solution. Great, thank you. Um, okay, if there's no further comments or questions. Um, can we have the roll call, please? Director R Rivera Smith. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. Director Harris. Aye.
Director Hersey? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we will now move to uh, our introduction items and introduction item number one is the hiring of Dr. Brent C. Jones as interim superintendent and approval of interim superintendent's employment agreement. And as the sponsor of this, I will make a brief statement. Um, so at our last board meeting, the, the board voted to authorize me as board president to negotiate a contract with Dr. Brent Jones to serve as interim superintendent. And following that authorization and with um, the assistance of our district legal counsel, John Sirqui, a contract was successfully negotiated with Dr. Jones, uh, which is presented to you today at, for intro. Uh, we used introduction, we used Superintendent Juno's contract as a starting point and then negotiated a number of changes which were reviewed and approved by the di district's lawyers and also by Dr. Jones's lawyer. Um, that contract is attached to the bar here as a product of these negotiations. Um, we also referenced uh, prior uh, interim uh, contracts in, in um, previous um, iterations um, when we've had re such replacements. And um, Chief Legal Counsel Greg Narva is also on the line. Um, and, and while he can't uh, speak to any legal advice that he and Mr. Sirqui offered, um, he can um, also answer questions in terms of, of the contract. Um, so um, with that, um, unless Chief Narva wants to add something, um, I will go first to Director Hersey for any uh, questions. <clears throat> <clears throat> no questions for me. Excited to move forward. Thank you, Director Harris. No questions for me. I will just restate for the record that uh, I much would have preferred this to be a community engagement piece, and I will not be voting for it. But in the event that this passes, I will give Dr. Jones my best effort. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, thank, I, um, I had one question, and I'm trying to find it right now looking in the bar. There was something added to this that uh, following the interim um, position, there would be a place, Dr. Jones would be given another role in our district. Is that, did I read that right? I'm trying to find it right now, but you can let me know. Uh, do you want me to, how about, well, let me go to Director uh, Rankin and then we'll come back to you. Um, I do know what part you're talking about, but since um, I don't have it right in front of me right this moment, um, we can both pull it up and then uh, come back to that. Are you okay with that? Sure thing, yep. Okay, uh, Director Rankin. Thanks. Um, I don't have any questions. I just want to highlight for anybody, uh, community members listening, to note that this is introduction and it, the uh, materials are attached to the board agenda on the website. So if you have questions or concerns um, and um, want us to, to notice or consider uh, anything, Please do read that and email email the board um, as soon as you can because the next time we we see this item it will be for action where we will be voting as a board. Um, that's it. Okay, Director Rivera Smith, did you find? Uh, thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rivera Smith, did you find what you're talking about? Is it on page one at the end? Yes, at the end of section A of background information, um, after June 30th, 2022, the board anticipates that the district will hire and employ Dr. Jones in another yet to be determined executive position. Um, so my question is about that is, is, is that our purview because we're hiring executive positions to be the role of the permanent superintendent who we then hire? Uh, do you want me to speak to that first, Chief Legal Counsel Nerver, or 
Do you want sure. To I think you can talk about uh, the the anticipation there. I, I can address um, why this is in in the bar as an anticipation rather than. Well, actually, why, why don't I go first? As long as I'm seizing okay. the microphone. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> as I understand it. Um, uh, Dr. Jones is is interested in remaining with the district in some capacity, and and Director Hampson's the one who's been speaking with him directly, so she can correct me if I'm wrong. But is interested in in continuing to serve the district in some capacity, following his term as interim superintendent. Uh, the bar notes that it's anticipated that that a role could be found for him to stay on. It's not a term of the contract. It's not. Um, uh, it, it, it's not a, not not a promise that's being made. It's more uh, the spirit in which this is being entered into. That hopefully this is setting the stage not just for a one and done term, but a, a long term uh, employment relationship. But it's but the contract is just for the term as interim superintendent. That's the only thing the board will be asked to vote on at its next meeting. Yeah, and I would just say that's the the um, in terms of the desire to for this to be a long-standing relationship, but not a long-standing one in terms of a permanent um, employment as superintendent, but in a lesser role. Um, we do have um, limited authority in terms of what we can require or agree to or commit this board to with respect to that. Um, but so that it, we've provided that the spirit of that is that um, we're entering into this relationship with hopes of it continuing, even if it's in a um, or in a lesser or not or you know one step down role from um, superintendent. Thank you for um, clarifying that. Um, yeah, I don't really have any other questions. I like Director Harris. Um, would have loved to see more communication on this. I understand the time frame we're in and um, that Dr. Jones is a really qualified candidate. So um, I have no other questions tonight. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if there are no other questions, uh, we have now come to the board comment section of the Director, agenda. Director Hampson. Oh, I'm sorry, over. Director DeWolf. I forgot I put you at the end of the order. Sorry, yeah. Director Dewell, please, any questions? Uh, no questions, but I did just want to just, um, you know, while, while I have a moment here just to say, uh, uh, I think that the um, the concerns raised about this process not including some sort of long-term community engagement are a little, uh, they're missing the mark. The, the, the reason I think that, that we are doing this, this, this way is because we have listened to community about wanting a thorough and robust, comprehensive community engagement process that includes community, students, educators, families, people from different communities, backgrounds, and identities being part of picking our permanent superintendent. So I think um, it feels a little <clears throat> disingenuous to say that this process didn't include that when the point of this is to bring on somebody who we trust, who we know, who is an incredible leader in this community, who can get us through this transition while we find the permanent. So I am excited about Dr. Brent Jones joining us. And I want to just give special shout out to President Hampson uh, and for folks listening. Um, the role of the president is a very difficult position. And I know that the work that you put in, the, the long hours, day, night, uh, and every hour in between um, to to really support this district at this time. So I, I understand that you've done a lot of work on this and I really appreciate that because um, like I said before, we are all volunteers and so the amount of time you're putting in is above and beyond and I'm so grateful to you for that. So that's all I have to say, thanks. Thank you and um, and and just as a, since you bring up that note about engagement, um, it is getting this um, taken care of and um, some other obviously critical uh, items related to in-person um, services for our students that, that we have in front of us. Um, one of the most critical tasks we have is, is then that next bar that needs to come forward um, to outline what that superintendent, um, that very uh, um, deeply engaged process for uh, what that superintendent hiring um, will look like, but starting with the the, the place of um, 
how how we will start to engage with community to even define what the process is. Um, so we're really we're starting that far back in, in terms of that. And I'm I'm excited about mm -hmm. that. I'm excited about um, leaning into um, community and really getting a sense of um, how do we, how do we get deep deep into our communities and and figure out um, how to really develop some relationships that are going to get us to um, our next uh, hopefully longer term leader. Um, okay, so with that, um, thank you so much, directors, and um, we will um, be back to vote on this on the 24th, and then uh, we will now move to uh, board comments. And so we'll go first uh, with Director Hersey. Hey everyone, how's it going? Oh, Thank you so I'm much. sorry, I, I'm Director Hersey. I'm so sorry. Um, okay. We have, uh, I, I missed a part. Um, before we move into the general board comments, I will first note that the um, annual board director and senior staff ethics disclosure forms are completed and are posted for public viewing on the agenda um, for those that would like to um, see uh, the ways in which we have other ties to the, the district um, for full disclosure. So apologies, Director Hersey, and please um, go ahead. No worries at all. It is all good. Um, <clears throat> just quick words of thanks, quite frankly. Thank you to uh, first senior staff for all of the amazing work folks at various um, intersections have been putting in. I know that everyone in our system is just feeling super strapped right now. So we see you, thank you for the work that you've been putting in, but especially thank you for our educators who in the midst of everything that is going on, um, not only go above and beyond in terms of educating our children, but also have been taking time out of their day to uh, reach out to us as the elected officials that provide oversight for this district to um, share their concerns and their very real fears and anxiety about what it means to return to school. And I just want to say that as an educator myself, uh, I thoroughly, and I know that I, this goes for the entire board, appreciate that feedback because it gives us better and broader context around what this not only means for you as educators, but also what this means for your students and the families that you work with on a daily basis. So please continue sending that feedback as we work harder and harder to come to an agreement and to most importantly deliver on a fair contract that is not only in the interest of our educators, quite frankly, but also in the interest of our students and their families. Uh, these conversations become incredibly difficult when there is so much competing information and it feels as though the target is always moving. And I think that as long as we as a system, and I mean everybody, continue to center students, educators, and safety, because those are going to be the folks who are on the ground every single day continuing to work with our children, and we sitting in spaces where most of us are not spending in or have not spent a ton of time in a K-12 classroom. I, I think that we just need to take a moment and take a breath and make sure that we're seeing each other for all of what we are bringing to whatever space it might be, whether it be the bargaining table or your virtual classroom, and really just take a moment to really authentically try to see one another and all of the anxiety and fear that is, and, and quite frankly, confusion that is happening right now. Um, so again, just thank you to our teachers who are out there killing it, crushing it on a daily basis. I, I know that I speak for the board when I say we appreciate you. Um, special shout out to the District 7 meetings as I do every opportunity that I can. All the folks who continually show up to those meetings and provide their input, um, I just cannot thank you enough. I think that as, as we push forward to whatever reopening these physical buildings, not reopening school because schools have been open for a long time, but reopening these physical buildings, that group specifically has been doing some really incredible work since before we even began school um, 
this year. So again, just a huge shout out to the folks who have been joining us uh, on those weekly calls. And just, I look forward to continuing to work with you hand in hand to figure out how do we provide um, as many services and opportunities as possible for our students, especially those furthest away from educational justice and especially our black students. Uh, for those of you who are at home listening and who are incredibly frustrated with the um, lack of progress toward uh, getting your student back to some sense of normalcy, um, I, I totally understand and I feel you. I hear where you are coming from. At the same time, we've got to make sure that we get this right because if we do not provide a fair contract, if we do not uh, move into the direction of reopening these physical buildings it, together and with a very clear and honest plan to do so effectively, then we run the risk of being in a position where we potentially have to close again. We run the risk of doing more harm and causing more disruption to an already chaotic time. So I think everyone on this call would agree that we are excited and we are raring to get our students back to a place to where they can continue to form and build on those relationships that they have with their educators and their friends. Um, but the primary, the primary objective here is to protect life, to make sure that we are not causing more harm by sending folks back to buildings without making sure that we can deliver on mitigating as much risk as possible and providing a fair contract for our educators. So again, thank you for all of the feedback that folks have been sending. Continue to send it. As I said before, that is what we utilize in all of our decision making. So as we move forward, again, we just appreciate that you have chosen um, to entrust us with your children and we are working tirelessly to figure out a way to make good on that trust and provide a system that is going to be one that is safe, one that is welcoming and one that we can all, educators, students, families, you name it, be excited to return to at some point. So I'll end it there. Thank you for the time, and I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you, Director Hersey. Director Harris? Thank you, President Hanson. Appreciate it. I would echo and emphasize what my colleague, Director Hersey, had to say, and I will add to that. Folks that want to go back to school, if you could let your legislators State Superintendent Chris Reichdahl, Governor Jay Inslee, know that you would very, very much like to see a new category of vaccines and starting with our educators that are assisting students accessing special education services. Um, it, it's very ironic that um, Folks are telling us to go back to school, but at the same time, not necessarily recognizing the fear and the anxiety of our teachers and folks that are living in multi-generational households uh, to give them a boost up in terms of getting those vaccines. Now, I will appreciate that we have a vaccine shortage. I will appreciate that... Uh, it's not as well organized as we all would like to see, but our parents and families can absolutely help the district and the teachers by lobbying for same. Um, additionally, there's been a great deal of traffic and conversation about the potential of cuts of transportation to option schools and Director Rivetta Smith and myself will be holding a Zoom meeting at three o'clock on uh, Saturday at three. And that'll be uploaded to both of our board pages. We've invited principals of the option schools to attend. I believe uh, Chief Berge will be invited to attend as well to talk about the finances and issues of this. And with any luck at all, we can communicate even more clearly. Um, to those folks that are working so hard, I give my deepest thanks. These are not easy times. I do not in any way, shape, or form discount the stress and anxiety that families are feeling 
But I also know that good people are working very, very hard. And when you send your questions and your comments to the board, if you could provide constructive uh, input, much appreciate creative ideas. We're open to them. Just look at things like outdoor education, et cetera, that have come forth, and rightly so. And if you could tell us which school and what grades your students are, that also helps us shift, shift, excuse me, S-I-F-T, not S-H-I-F-T, shift the information and triangulate it to get a better sense of, of where information is coming from. Um, again, it's an honor and a privilege to serve and to serve with such great people. Thank you. Director Rivera-Smith. I'm sorry, can you come back to me? Sorry about that. Director Rankin. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I, I will just start by um, thanking everyone who who came in and gave uh, public testimony. And I especially wanna thank our student speaker. The student speakers are always um, some of my favorite parts of board meetings. And um, so thank you, Kira, for talking about um, Skill Center and the opportunities that it provides. Um, Hands-on learning is, is is huge and is even you know more limited in a remote setting than um, than it would be normally. But getting more hands-on learning, more opportunities for for students to make uh, physical connections with their education and um, learn skills and participate in things that feel very very relevant is something um, that I am really excited about. Um, in general, and so I want to just thank you for highlighting that for us. Um, in terms of transportation, um, I I don't know what we can um, how we can communicate out more broadly. You know, the board doesn't have its own communication channels um, other than our our Facebook pages and comments right now. Um, but I I really you know I've been looking over a lot of data. Um, about uh, ridership and um, and in terms of budget and in terms of uh, especially uh, in relation to the clean energy uh, resolution that we just passed. Um, you know, we the the overall system of transportation in Seattle Public Schools, how we make those routes and such has has. Uh, really not been looked at for a while and so we do have a work set in addition to the um, community meeting that director harris mentioned um director hampson and i had a um thanks to uh seattle council ptsa hosted a um uh listening and and community session for families of color and option schools about transportation um a couple weeks ago uh, there is also going to be a work session coming up on the 23rd I think to discuss transportation um, in relationship to budget considerations. And um, related to that, the as, as Director Harris alluded to, the budget situation is real and it is, is big and it is heavy and um, option school transportation and transportation more broadly is being looked at because we are in a a really tight spot with um, with finances. You know, there's always everybody always is there's always budget cuts, budget something, but um, it's it's actually pretty dire. Um, we have received word from the state um, estimating some funds coming to us for recovery from COVID, but uh, we. Um, we don't know if the state will hold us harmless for a uh, transportation shortfall, for loss of enrollment, for various other things. Basically, our expenditures as a district, our, our costs exceed um, the resources that are given to us by the state. And um, 
we've got to find ways to make it up. So as a board, it's our, as people like to say, it's our fiduciary duty, and it is in fact state law to pass a balanced budget every year. We cannot, you know, we can't spend money we don't have. It's illegal. Um, so while we have to make cuts that seem like, you know, you know, why are we pitting this against the other, or why are you, you know, doing this and not this? Everything in a budget in the budget is a choice, and for anything we, um, any changes that we have to make uh, to add services, we have to make a decision about what will lose funding. That's just that's the unfortunate reality, and so um, as uh, community members, I would ask. Um, uh, to please, you know, continue to advocate, get loud with the state. Um, we need new progressive revenue. We need to be able to have um, relief funds from the federal government for um, recovery from COVID. We need those funds to come directly to us as a district to be able to spend on those recovery efforts as opposed to backfilling um, transportation shortfalls and other operational costs. We, we really need to be able to do um, to have access to that funding so that we don't have to keep cutting services to students and um, and potentially uh, staff. So, which is of course also in service to students. So, uh, can't put too fine a point on it. We we need we need support. Um, I uh, let's see. Oh yeah, to the point of uh, engagement around the superintendent search, we have in, um, you know, this situation with uh, COVID is the, you know, the cloud that hangs over all of the other decisions and considerations that have to be made all the time in a district. And I, I, it's funny, we've been told that we're being, you know, too slow to hire a permanent superintendent and too fast to hire an interim. And I, that's kind of a funny complaint because the whole point of being swift with an interim was so that we could um, keep operations and maintain, you know, forward progress and support of our students over the next, um, uh, into next school or over the course of next school year and have time to do that deeper engagement and get um, community input and have a community led um, process for finding a superintendent. So the urgency and not urgency, those are um, related and actually makes make a lot of sense to me. Um, outdoor learning, I'm we were uh, excited to see some photos of some sites that have started really, really exciting to see kids together learning outside. Just a reminder that that is an option. That's a rolling process that's open. Um, to any teacher building at any time and um, central office staff in charge of that initiative have been really supportive and great at um, figuring out the process to move things through from propo proposal to um, action and um, uh, there's there's support there to uh, you know help help figure out the feasibility and whatnot so so keep the applications keep the submissions coming um, lastly, I'll say uh, uh, with regard to concerns about the Northgate site, um, as a member of the operations committee, I asked some staff and as the representative for the area where Northgate Elementary is, uh, I asked for a meeting with staff um, to better understand um, some of the issues that have been brought up by community. And so that will be happening, um, I think, over break. And then uh, finally, um, I am going to look at after the midwinter break setting up. I'm tired of Zoom and Teams, so I'm going to look at uh, setting up some community meetings, maybe at uh, lunch near lunch sites in my district, um, just as an opportunity for people to come by, pick up lunch, let me know what you're thinking, let me know what's going on in uh, District One, and so I will be posting those, uh, picking some dates, and making sure that the board office gets them so that they are on. The website and uh, I think that's all. Wash your hands, wear your mask. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, uh, Director DeWolf.
Thank you, President Hampson. Um, uh, I don't have m much to say other than uh, what I've been able to say tonight about our uh, climate resolution. Um, so I'll just double down on my gratitude to Director uh, Rivera-Smith, the folks from the organizations and individuals who endorsed it, and especially the students, the educators and the families and the community members who helped that effort. Uh, I just wanted to share too, I think Director Hersey mentioned last night I was yeah. able to have a community meeting with the Thurgood Marshall families and so I want to thank the families and the young folks who joined our meeting last night. It was a really, really wonderful opportunity to connect uh, with one of the school communities in my district and I know that obviously Director Hersey has some of the folks um, based on the uh, attendance area in his district as well. So it was just a really great conversation. Um, and just to, just to affirm that we, we do hear you, whether it's by email or community meetings, and we hold everything you say close to our hearts and understand the, the difficulty uh, that everyone faces um, trying to experience and go to and participate in school during this pandemic. And um, so we're there with you on, on really wanting this to be over and we want to do it right and want to make sure everybody's safe. And so we'll continue to, you know, obviously, with the aim of coming back um, someday. Um, and we'll work towards that. But um, outside of that, um, I just wanted to elevate one thing from our operations committee meeting, which I think um, is, is a little, little bit uh, lost, um, maybe buried the lead. Um, but James Baldwin was uh, uh, an LGBTQ, uh, black LGBTQ cultural and literary hero. And the fact that one of our elementary schools will be changing their name um, to James Baldwin Academy is a huge deal. And so thank you to the uh, family support worker there. Um, and uh, the school leader, um, Ms. Fontelroy, for bringing that forward. I'm really excited to see that through. Um, and with that, I just thank you all for a really great night and, and back to you, President Hampson. Um, thank you all. Um, uh, we are about to get cut off from SPS TV due to a technical difficulty. Um, we have a matter of seconds. And as a result, um, rather than recess us and bring us back, um, I'm going to uh, forego my own comments, but please look at my um, pers my personal Facebook page that has um, Thursdays in the park with Director Hampson, um, opportunity to meet in person and walk um, coming up. And um, so I'll just take a couple extra minutes um, next meeting and look forward to seeing you all in other formats. Um, so um, Peter Gigi, um, be well, and um, we will uh, see you tomorrow. Many of you. Oh, I'm sorry. We I forgot that we had had to come back to you. So, um, are you willing to forego, or do we need to recess and come back? No, I will forego. Don't worry about it. Um, I okay. appreciate that. I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um. <laughs>